And good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday morning. Welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. And this is what I call, again, my Morning Musings. Do not forget, hey, folks, let me, let me remind you, time is running out really, really quickly. Do you realize it's almost October? Good grief. Anyway, my, my two books, this is my brand new book. Uh, these are the days when all things must be fulfilled. And my book, Seal Up Vision and Prophecy. Both of these books are built on the premise that all prophecy, all, pardon me, all prophecy, not just a little bit of it, not a, most of it, all prophecy was to be fulfilled by the time of the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Now, you may scoff at that. I never thought I'd come to that conclusion. But the force, the power, the clarity of Scripture has forced me to conclude that that is true. So go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com. At the very top of the page, you'll find a wonderful banner. Just click on it. When you order these two books, you're going to get a third book absolutely free, okay? Regular price of that book is $2.95 plus $4.95 shipping. So when you order these two, you're going to get that book free with free shipping on all three books. That's going to, folks, that's going to save you about 12 bucks, 12 or $13. I haven't done the exact precise math. Well, it's going to be even more than that, close to $16. So take advantage of the offer before the month runs out. Okay, so we are continuing our overview summary of what we have shared with you in our study, 822, 823 uh, videos now. Uh, this is 824, okay? In our study of the Olivet Discourse. I've tried to be thorough. I've tried to bring a lot of information to the plate so that you have plenty to study, so that you have a resource to go back to and by the way, thank you so very, very much for the fact that our subscribers are growing. Our viewership is growing slowly, but it's growing. I appreciate that so very, very much. Okay, so we want to talk, talk this morning about the abomination of desolation and the ensuing, the consequent great tribulation. Now, let me, let me remind you that our dispensational friends say, obviously the Great Tribulation hasn't happened because Jesus said it would be the greatest event that had ever happened since the world began and never or ever would be. So don't tell me that the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 was the Great Tribulation when, for instance, the pogrom against the Jews in World War II. I mean, after all, 11 million Jews perished. So... People look at these numbers like that and they completely think outside of the box of the significance. They focus on raw numbers, okay, instead of theological significance. I think Kenneth Gentry was absolutely correct in one regard. In discussing the, sign the significance and meaning of the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, he said, those who focus on raw numbers, that's my terminology, not his, and, and they say, well, 11 million Jews perished here, 6 million Jews died over here, blah, blah, blah. They are absolutely failing to consider the covenantal significance of the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. And as Gentry points out in his book, He Shall Have Dominion, there had never been an end of the age destruction, the end of an entire covenant history as what happened in AD 70. Well, he's absolutely correct on that. Because you see, AD 70 was the end of the old covenant age. It was the end of the age of Moses and the law. It was the end of what Jesus and his contemporaries called this age. And it was the full arrival of what the rabbis and Jesus called the age to come. 
by the way, once we latch on to that significance and realize there was kind of a, an overlap between, quote, this age and the age to come. And by the way, Kenneth Gentry even admits that. He said, but he says, we today have our feet in both worlds. We have our feet in this age and we have our feet in the age to come. No, he's overlooking the fact that the this age was the age of Moses and the law. The age to come, this is what the rabbis taught, by the way. The age to come was the age of Messiah and the new covenant. It was not an age after the age of Messiah and the new covenant. But that's what gentry and all futurists do. That's what Kim Riddlebogger does in his book in defense of amillennialism. Folks, that's wrong. I develop all of this in my book, by the way, The Last Days Identified. So once we realize the significance of this age and the age to come, once we latch on to what the New Testament teaches, actually teaches, in regard to the abomination of desolation and the Great Tribulation, it can, it can blow our traditional paradigms completely out of the water. Remember, as I was about to say a few moments ago, our dispensational friends say that, you know, the Great Tribulation has got to be future because of numbers. Numbers of people who died here versus numbers of people who died there. What about the meaning? What about the significance of AD 70? Furthermore, let's just take a look at what the Bible emphatically teaches. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, am your brother in the kingdom and in the tribulation. Not some generic tribulation, but the tribulation. You know, John was present when Jesus said that the great tribulation was going to come in his generation. John was present and heard that. Now, here is John saying that he was their brother, their companion in the kingdom and in the great tribulation. Now watch, in Revelation chapter 7, John was given a vision of 144,000 out of the 12 tribes of Israel. And they're wearing white robes. And an angel asked John, John, who are these? And John says, I don't know, but you do. And so I'm going to begin reading with Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. I said to him, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones, now pay very, very careful attention and catch the power of this. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they're before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his temple, and the one who sits on the throne will dwell among them. Who are the 144,000? Well, they're out of the 12 tribes of Israel. This is the righteous remnant of old covenant Israel. What did they experience? The great tribulation. But that's not the end of the story. In Revelation chapter 14, we have a recapitulation of the vision of the 144,000. Let's begin reading with verse 1, shall we? I looked, and behold, a lamb standing, let me do this, standing on Mount Zion. Uh, I'll be getting cataract, having cataract surgery before long, but in the meantime, I've got to get it up here so I can read it. <laughs> then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their forehead. So here's the 144,000 out of the 12 tribes that came out of the great tribulation. Okay? I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. I heard the voice of the harpers playing their harps. 
They sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living elder uh, creatures and elders, and no man could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. Now watch carefully. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Here's the kicker. This is what you absolutely must catch the power of. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. These are the first fruits. What does first fruits mean? Whoops. Uh, well, you know, it means first fruit. This means these 144,000 were the first generation Jewish Christians. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's connect our dots back. Revelation 7, 14, 144,000 come out of the great tribulation. Revelation 14, the 144,000 are the first fruits of those redeemed to God from man. That means that the first generation the first century generation of Jewish Christians went through the Great Tribulation. That means the Great Tribulation is not still going, ladies and gentlemen. It wasn't to go on. As Greg Beale says, oh, well, the entire Christian age is the Great Tribulation. Well, I'm sorry, with all due respect to Greg Beale, who, by the way, refused to debate me. That's ridiculous. That means that the Christian age is the time of the greatest tribulation that the world has ever seen or ever will see. Folks, that is utterly ridiculous. Let me reiterate this. The 144,000 come out of the great tribulation. The 144,000 are the first generation of Jewish Christians. Therefore, the Great Tribulation was in the first century. Now, by the way, James said, James chapter 1 and verse 18, by his own will he begat us that we, who's he writing to? Who's he writing about? Oh, to the 12 tribes of Israel. Of his own will begot he us that we might be a kind of first fruits. Which, by the way, kind of blows the idea that salvation was strictly for Israel of the first century. First fruits means there would be others, you know, others, others, others. It's ridiculous. So anyway, do you catch the power of this? Folks, the great tribulation, meaning the abomination of desolation, had to be a first century reality. That completely destroys the dispensational paradigm. It destroys those reformed amillennialists, again, like Kim Riddlebarger, who say, well, yeah, the events of, of the first century are typological of the yet future real great tribulation, the real abomination that's still coming. No, you can only have one first fruits, ladies and gentlemen. Just like Christ was the first fruit of those out from among the old covenant dead. There's only one first fruit. Only one time of first fruit, let me say that. And so as we pointed out in our initial teaching on abomination, desolation, great tribulation, these truths completely and destroy and totally destroy any future concept of an abomination of desolation, which means it completely and totally destroys any future application of a man of sin. 
which means it completely and destroys the application of a yet future great apostasy brought on by the man of sin. It completely destroys the idea of a yet future great tribulation, such as has never been since the foundation of the world or ever yet shall be. You know what? I kind of like that. Kind of like that. Okay. Thanks for joining me this Wednesday on Morning Musings. We will continue on Friday with our examination of Steve Gregg's book. We're wrapping that up real quickly. I've had a few comments about, oh, here, you need to study this next, answer this next, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, nothing has rang my bell. I'll be really honest about it. <laughs> so uh, nonetheless, I welcome your suggestions. So send me your suggestions about what you would like for me to review and respond to next. Okay. Well, thanks again for joining me and I'll see you on Friday.